Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? How's the projection? We're good? Good, good, good. Someone smarter than myself once said, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So hopefully today will go a little bit smoother than the first few minutes. So quickly, who am I? I've written a bunch of books. Three of them are here. Two of them aren't. And when I'm not writing, I'm usually speaking and helping companies optimize their use of technology sometimes. Today is to talk for around 60 minutes on platforms and ecosystems, APIs and SDKs, existing platforms, emerging platforms, upsides, downsides, and then I hope to answer around 30 minutes worth of questions. I will also be signing copies of the book a little bit later, and I believe at 1 o'clock I'll be doing a reading of the book. But first, I love doing this. I'd like everyone to quickly stand up, and I want to try a very quick experiment. I did this once with 800 people. Uh, what do we have, about 100 here, 80, give or take? Okay. Have a seat if you use anything from Amazon. Kindle, Amazon.com, Kindle Fire. Wow. We might set a record here. For the people standing, do you use anything from Apple? Gotcha. There they go, and then there were zero. I didn't have to get to Facebook and to Google. Around a year ago, in Washington, D.C., there were 300 people there, and it was one of my first speaking gigs on the new book. And I went through Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and at the end, there was one guy standing, and the moderator asked the guy, which cave do you live in? <laughs> the interesting thing about Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google is that I would argue they are largely consumer technologies. Yes, AWS attracts a lot of businesses, and there are companies like Pinterest and many others that use Google Apps. But each one of you has alternatives, right? No one is conscripted to use Facebook, right? There are benefits to using it, but you willingly use it. Ditto for Apple, Amazon, Google. There are certainly other search engines. So to me, it's a very interesting question. Why do people voluntarily use the products and services for these four companies? Think back, I had a discussion with a number of you last night about, say, 15, 20 years ago, in sort of the heyday of enterprise IT. Back then, forget the fact that Facebook didn't exist. Apple was still kind of a niche product. If I had to name the big four, they would have been what? Oracle, SAP, IBM, Microsoft. But think about those four companies for a minute. I have nothing bad to say about them. Oh, thank you. You used those companies' products and services typically at work and typically because you had to, not necessarily because you wanted to. This dovetails nicely into the consumerization of IT. We have so much choice. Why do some of us willingly pay twice as much for an Apple MacBook Pro or an iPad? They're certainly not the cheapest things out there. Why do we use Amazon when some of us may not agree with our politics? Well, I started to think about that right after my previous book, one that isn't here, came out. And that book is called The New Small. How a new breed of small businesses is harnessing the power of emerging technology. And in that book, I cover 11 small businesses, and a lot of them aren't even tech businesses per se. There's Chef Tony, who runs a seafood restaurant in Maryland. There's a law firm in Minnesota. But they all understand that open source technologies, cloud technologies, social technologies are really making a difference. And when that book came out, as a small business owner, I said to myself, I consider myself one of the new small. But what happened, God forbid, I couldn't work for myself? What if I had to work for a large company? Which one would it be and why? Which big companies are acting small? Which companies are innovating like smaller companies, despite their size? And quickly, it became apparent to me that those four companies were Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And it turned out that I wasn't the only person who had noticed the gang of four. I will read the quote because I don't want to get it wrong. And he said, about two so at the All Things D conference, it seems to me that there are four companies that are exploiting platform strategies really well. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And he famously called them the gang of four. Now at the time, and even to this day, Microsoft and Google don't exactly see eye to eye. By not including Microsoft, Schmidt, who at the time was CEO, now he's chairman of the board, was sort of taking a shot at Microsoft. But 
I, does anyone here own a Windows phone, just out of curiosity? Okay, one person. Windows tablet, same thing. Okay, one person. Astonishing to me. I met one person who owns a Windows phone. Guess where he works? Microsoft. So I was intrigued by this notion of platforms and ecosystems, and that's what I discuss in the book, what I'll be talking about today. The Gang of Four really has ushered in the age of the platform. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. In Las Vegas, like Seattle, like Silicon Valley, like Austin, like Boston, New York, has a very vibrant startup ecosystem. If I had a nickel for every startup founder I met, when I ask him what his company or her company does, says, oh, we're a platform that does whatever, I'd have a lot of nickels. It's become a very trendy term. And platforms in and of themselves don't guarantee success, but if you look at not just the gang of four, but companies like Automatic, which one's WordPress, like Salesforce.com, like Twitter, they're embracing platform thinking, and those are all household names. So we really have entered the age of the platform. But what exactly is a platform? Um, I was joking last night that I think it was Winston Churchill who said, uh, success begins with a common understanding of terms. So what really is a platform? First up, this notion of a platform isn't new. And in the book, I distinguish between little p and big P. Technology platforms with a little p really have existed for a long time, going back to the DOS days. Right? Operating systems, one could even argue telephone lines were platforms, so to speak. But platform with a big P, I felt, was something very different. And it really is a fundamentally new business model that scores of, company, of companies are embracing. As I said, it's not just Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. Um, even Kickstarter, I would argue, is a fundraising platform. Or if you think about Facebook, when Zynga went public, it was about two years ago, at one point Zynga had a $1 billion valuation, and it made, at the time, something like 90% of its revenue off of Facebook. Okay? So interesting stuff. Okay. Now, in the book, I introduced this notion of planks. And a platform really is nothing without its planks. Companies will typically have more than one source of revenue. And yes, a company like Google makes roughly 90% of its revenue, probably more, from internet advertising. But trust me, if you look at what Google's doing with Glass, with Google Docs, it's trying to find other planks, right? YouTube, people thought they were crazy for spending, in 2007, $1.65 billion on YouTube. Now it's looking like a smart move. So by planks, I mean features, apps, products, or services. And they're very democratic. I have an app in the App Store. It's based on my third book, The New Small. Now it's only for iOS, it's not for, for Android yet. But I don't consider myself a proper developer. So they're not just reaching out to, I would argue 10, 15 years ago, proper developers. Right? If you're an author, you can self-publish on Kindle. Right? If, you want, if you're a musician, you can get your music up on iTunes. Okay? So these are very democratic planks for the most part. And they're really very third-party friendly. They're embracing this notion of ecosystems, right? Users, customers, communities, developers. Um, about three, four months ago, Microsoft has for a long time realized that it's trailing with regard to mobility, right? Apps, tablets. Microsoft took recently a $900 million write-down on the surface, okay? Not really going as well as they thought. So Bomber's on stage in his own inimitable way, screaming developers, 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 right? But a lot louder. So, and it's interesting to note the level of entrepreneurship that takes place as a result of these platforms. And one of my favorite examples here is a company called TweetDeck. Does anyone use that for managing social media, TweetDeck? Okay, it's similar to Hootsuite, which I personally use. And TweetDeck was built off of Twitter's open API, and it would let you create different streams. If you've looked at a single stream in Twitter, it can be a little disorienting, right? What if you could create streams? So if you had a hashtag for big data, like I do, or a hashtag for a list or something. Uh, you can segment Twitter. So TweetDeck built it, its product, and Twitter came along and purchased it for $40 million. And so that's just one example. Now, there are some downsides to platforms, which I'll talk about in a bit. But we're talking about development, in some cases, from crazy parts of the world. 
Now, I don't want this to seem terribly abstract. I want to go through a specific example here with Google. I was around in 1998 when search was a mess. Does anyone here remember search in 1997? Right? It was, it was kind of laughable when you think about it today. So Google, in 1998, I argue in the book, really wasn't a platform. It was a search engine. It was a very powerful search engine. It was a lot better than Alta Vista and Lycos and Yahoo. Funny story, by the way. Does anyone know? I'm going to give away a prize. If you can guess the number, give or take, I will give you a copy of the new book. In 1997, give or take, Larry and Sergey were PhD students at Stanford. And they weren't thinking about creating a company that's worth today $400 billion. They weren't thinking about changing the world. They were thinking about getting their PhDs. So they were pawning their technology off, and Yahoo and Excited Home had the option to buy Google's technology. Does anyone know what Larry and Sergey were asking? Okay, I heard a million. That's close. Go higher. Go lower. There you go. <laughs> also, I'm okay. One point five million. That's all they wanted. Okay. Now, Google is obviously worth a lot more than that. They spend more money on that, on all sorts of projects that we've heard about and many more that we haven't. So why did Google change? Why did it become a platform? I thought that was a very interesting question to answer. To make a long story short, in this age of platforms, even if you're a really powerful single-purpose company, you can be cannibalized very quickly. And Google's top brass has understood this for a very long time. The technology landscape is littered with companies that have become complacent. Has anyone ever here read the book by Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma? OK. Companies get fat. They get happy. They get complacent. Does anyone know what year Kodak invented digital film? Digital film, digital photography. Yes, yes, 1974, I believe. Last year, Kodak declared bankruptcy. It's selling its patents to, I believe, Apple for around a billion dollars. That's astonishing to me. Now, I was very, very young in 1974. But I will bet you a Coke that at some point, someone at Kodak said, what about digital film? Look what I invented. And that person was summarily told to shut up. <laughs> because that was a massive threat to Kodak's business. Remember, at one point, Kodak and Polaroid were enormously profitable companies. So Christensen talks about this in The Innovator's Dilemma. And if anyone's ever read the Steve Jobs book by Walter Isaacson, I, I highly recommend it. It's an excellent book. Jobs has this quote, it's better to cannibalize yourself than let your competition do it for you. And the top brass at Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google all understand that. Right now, I'm almost finished with the new book by Brad Stone on Amazon called The Everything Store. It just came out. It's the first in-depth look at Amazon. Other books have been written, but quite frankly, I don't think they're very good. It's the same sort of notion there. At Amazon, Jeff Bezos has dropped prices on AWS, I believe, 39 times. He's done this in some cases when AWS was already the cheapest game in town. There's a great quote from Bezos. It's not in the book, but I heard it since it came out. Your margin is my opportunity. Those companies say what you will about them. They're not complacent. Google, for its part, did not want to become another Microsoft. It's a great CNET article around three years ago about how Microsoft actually, uh, iPad just hit its, I believe, third anniversary. So even before the iPad, a couple of engineers within Microsoft had developed a very promising tablet. It got up to the Balmer level. And the fundamental question was, does this help Windows or does this help Office? And the answer was, no, that's not the point. And that project was scuttled. Those two guys left the company. Google did not want to become another Microsoft. If you're too big, then there are vested interests within the company that don't want you to innovate, that don't want you to change. This is why Google has spent untold millions of dollars on Google+. And remember, this is not Google's first bite at the apple. Who here remembers Orkut? For some reason, only big in Brazil. Don't ask me why. There was also Google Wave, Google Buzz, 
Now we're on Google+. Plus. This is the fourth attempt to get social right, but when you think about it, the paranoia makes a lot of sense. Has anyone here ever tried Facebook search, the new one, social search? Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd say it's only now about a 2, but think about it. There are fundamentally questions that Facebook search can answer that Google can't. Yes, Google right now owns about 67% of the U.S. search market. Microsoft screams that Google has a monopoly, which is interesting when you think about it, since what, 10, 12 years ago, Microsoft was claiming that it was a free market situation and it was being sued by the Department of Justice for having monopoly with Windows. Well, what's easier, switching a search engine or switch, switching an operating system? But there are fundamentally questions that Facebook could answer that Google can't, even though Facebook doesn't make nearly as much money as Google does with regard to search. If I want to know how many of my friends in Las Vegas went to a Chinese restaurant in the last six months, Google doesn't know. Facebook may not know, but Facebook has the data and it could know. And that scares Larry and Sergey. So there's this paranoia. That's why Google became a platform. So we know why Google did it, but the question is how? Google added different planks to its platform. Gmail, Maps, Android was a huge one. Google Docs, Plus, it bought Blogger, YouTube, all of these different planks. And I'd worked right when the book came out with a PR firm, and I did a couple of interviews on the book for some decent media outlets. And one of the subjects that would routinely come up is Google's change, announced in January of 2012, to essentially integrate its privacy policy. There used to be a policy around YouTube, one around Gmail, Right? Well, all of a sudden, effective March 1st, 2012, Google said, one company, one policy, regardless of the different products and services. Now, they didn't use the term planks, but that's exactly what they were referring to. For example, if you're watching cat videos on YouTube, you might see cat ads in your Gmail, and that would scare some people. All right. Now, I would always tell people, just like I said at the beginning of the conversation today, no one forces you to use Gmail. So if you're not paying anything, guess what? You are the product. So Google added all of these different planks, and I would argue has become a true platform. Okay. Now, there are differences in the way that Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have approached building their platforms. But let's first talk about what they have in common. They frequently add different planks to their platforms. And as I mentioned before, sometimes these planks aren't terribly successful. Google, as I said before, has arguably failed three times with regard to social networks, but it keeps trying. Amazon has consistently added planks. AWS, some people estimate, is approximately a $4 billion a year business. Think about it. Some person in 2006 within Amazon, I guarantee this happened, said, you know, we're generating a lot of compute power from our data centers, and guess what? A lot of our sales are seasonal. Do we really want to shut off the data centers in, say, July, when not as many people are buying? No. What if we just sold it? Now, again, in 1974, when someone in Kodak brought up that question, the answer was, shut up. The answer at Amazon was, let's see where that goes. Now, it took a long time for Amazon to figure out AWS. In that third book, The New Small, I talked to one of the very first users of it, and he said it was clunky. It was kind of like going to your electricity company and saying, I'd like to buy X number of watts this month. Okay, so they had to refine their pricing model, but they eventually got it right. So Amazon doesn't just sell books anymore or physical goods like CDs. Amazon's become a publisher. Amazon's become a cloud computing company. Apple, in 2007, changed its name. It used to be called Apple Computer. Does anyone know what percentage of revenues come from, say, the MacBook Pro? Take a guess. Percentage. Sorry? It's about 15. Now, it's still 15 on a huge number, but it's 15%. Most of the revenue is coming from iPad and iPhone. So Apple Computer wasn't just a good, changing it to Apple wasn't just a good branding decision, and Steve Jobs knew something about marketing, right? It, it more accurately reflected the company that Apple had become. These four companies, I would argue, have business applications, but fundamentally they are more consumer than business oriented. Steve Jobs, for instance, was famous for not pursuing CIOs, right? He was more interested in selling to the end customer. He wasn't chasing the enterprise, but you know what? The enterprise started chasing Apple. 
I believe it was Pfizer that bought something like 70,000 iPads soon after it came out. Because if you work in the sales force, it's a lot sexier to show an iPad than a bunch of paper. So these companies, I would argue, are more consumer oriented. They are rooting, rooted, excuse me, in emerging technologies. Apple's the only exception here. Amazon, Apple, I'm sorry, Amazon, Facebook, and Google were really all sort of internet native, web native, right? Apple had to redefine itself because I believe it was founded in 1976. So these companies understand contemporary technologies. They're not trying to retrofit anything. As I'm reading the Amazon book, I'm amazed at the level of change they've had to affect, given how the web has changed, given how their volumes have increased. They would rather blow something up, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about how Twitter did the same thing in 2008, than not. Scale has become very important these days. If something goes viral, if something blows up, you don't want your site to be down. There's a great book on Facebook by David Kirkpatrick called The Facebook Effect, much, much better than the movie. And Zuckerberg early on was paranoid that the site would go down. Does anyone here remember circa 2002, a little site called Friendster? Okay, I do, I was on it, it was amazing. Except it was down 90% of the time. If I had a nickel for every one of those four or four hours, I'd have a lot of nickels. So they understand the importance of always being up, of being very user friendly. They understand the importance of the consumerization of IT, of the fact that people have a great deal of choice. They understand BYOD. You can bring whatever device you want into the enterprise. There's a, not a whole lot that IT departments can do to stop it. And with a nod to Mr. Jobs, one more thing. Iconic leaders. I'm not a huge fan of corporate democracy. Right? I tend to find that a lot of things are sort of mishmashed together. And you don't necessarily see the one vision, how good a product could be. Mark Zuckerberg owns 57% of the sh voting shares of Facebook. Facebook, if you think about it, really is a referendum. Nothing can get by, nothing can get done at Facebook without Zuck being on board. Now, I remember a few years ago, Rupert Murdoch bought MySpace. I have nothing against Rupert Murdoch, but he's an old school media mogul. He's not a technology visionary. No one would ever confuse Rupert Murdoch or Mark Zuckerberg. So one of the challenges for someone like Tim Cook has been how do you succeed, right? If you're successful, you say, well, Steve Jobs set the table for you. And if you don't, people say you're not Steve Jobs. So that's a challenge for Apple. And it'd be interesting to see, I'm the guy who bought Apple at 675, pretty much near the high point. Uh, I'm sort of the anti-Warren Buffett. People want to know what I'm doing so they can do the opposite. Uh, but it'll be very interesting to see what happens without one of these iconic leaders. I want to spend some time now talking about how these companies have built their platforms. And one of the biggest issues I think out there is this notion of a continuum. Right. I don't find that a lot of platforms are either completely open or completely closed. Certainly, I would argue the platforms in the book tend to be more open than, say, in the mid-90s when I first started working in enterprise IT. I used to go from company to company, typically building reports or making some customizations to different systems, but I couldn't easily transport them. Right? Let's say it was an access database. I'd have to configure it at each client. Okay? We didn't really see the same toolkits that we do today. So if you take a look at a company like Twitter, when it started out in, say, 2008, 2009, even up until 2010, Twitter was incredibly developer-friendly. At one point, I read a statistic that there were something like a million different apps built on top of Twitter. Now, think about that. A million apps. Let's say that 95% of them aren't very good. Right? Okay. 5% are. 50,000 apps that take Twitter in a different direction, that do something useful. Right? Even today, a friend of mine runs a company called Wedgies, and they do polling straight from Twitter. Right? It's brain dead simple to use. A child can do it. You can embed the code. So you're taking Twitter in all these different directions. As I mentioned before, TweetDeck was acquired for $40 million, and we all love to do that. So for every success, there are many more failures. The point is, though, that Twitter was very open. However, now, Twitter has become much more closed. Right? Twitter has insisted upon a more consistent client. It doesn't want Twitter sort of bastardized. And that's really earned the ire of a great number of developers. So much so, and I mentioned this last night at, uh, at the talk, there are even projects now to create social networks that are so developer friendly 
they will never take money from advertisers. The problem is that these networks need money, right? So it's this conundrum, right? If Facebook ever charged, do you think it would have reached 1.2 billion users? Probably not. Personally, I wish Facebook would charge me $50 a year. I wrote a post on Inc.com about it, and people said I was an idiot. I would love to have a cleaner UI. I don't think you can compare the Google Plus UI versus the Facebook one. But think about it. Facebook needs to make money. They need to show you those ads. They need to try to monetize you. Google doesn't. So Twitter's become a lot more closed, and I would argue less developer friendly. Now, I'm not big on formulas and checklists. Um, there's a great business book called The Halo Effect uh, by Phil uh, Horowitz, but that's not his last name. I always mess that one up. And in hindsight, everything is obvious, right? A book like Black Swan also touches on the same thing. Remember, it isn't necessarily about being there first, OK? Amazon technically wasn't the first online bookstore, but it was one of the earliest ones. Google wasn't the first search engine. Facebook wasn't the first social network. And Apple has never been the first to mark with anything. iPod, I was one of the first people to have them. As soon as it came out, I bought it. It was certainly not the first MP3 player. iPad was not the first tablet. iPhone certainly was not the first smartphone. But there are all sorts of different ways to do it. Early on, Jeff Bezos at Amazon preached network effects. His mantra was get big fast. Right? He was all about scale and leveraging those economies. Again, Facebook didn't take that approach. In 2006, there were schools clamoring for Facebook because it was so hot. Remember, initially, you needed a .edu email address. It was only limited to the Ivy League. And there were schools, students from schools emailing Zuck saying, when are we getting Facebook? And he said, I want you to have it, but it needs to be good. We're not ready for you yet. We don't have enough servers. We don't want it to be down. So it isn't necessarily about getting big fast. Uh, Facebook did not take that approach. Again, Android is a much more open ecosystem than iOS. Android's the wild, wild west out there. Right? There is no one sort of official version. It's the antithesis of iOS. Uh, what did Tim Cook say the other day? Something like 60 million people downloaded iOS 7 within three days of it coming out. Was it two weeks ago? And I, and I was one of them. So there isn't one right way to do it. But scale, experimentation, and speed are key. In 2008, late 2008, early 2009, Twitter had reached an inflection point. We have a lot of techies in the audience, right? right? Has anyone ever heard of um, Scala? OK. It's an open source back end. Initially, Twitter was based on, something, based on something called Ruby on Rails. Some of you have probably heard of that one. And Ruby on Rails got Twitter to a certain point. But Ruby was not meant to handle 50,000 tweets a second on Monday Night Football, okay, when the Packers and the Seahawks played. Okay. It just wasn't meant to handle. Management had to decide. Were they in this for the long term, or should they cash out? Because trust me, Google would have bought them for a great deal of money. If Google offered $6 billion for Groupon, we're probably talking about a similar number. The guys from Twitter decided, yes, we are in this for the long term. So they blew up their back end, and they replaced Ruby with something called Scala. And now, anyone ever heard of the fail whale? Okay. We don't see the fail whale as much anymore. We'll still see it. Sometimes you can break Twitter. But it doesn't happen very often. Is it? So Twitter had to make a decision on what to do. And it decided that if it wanted to be successful, then it needed to augment its current back end to handle the kind of growth that it was capable of, of doing. Now, there are typically a mix of both the cathedral and the, gazar, and the bazaar. Has anyone read Eric S. Raymond's book? Okay. So again, there isn't necessarily one way of doing it. You could be open, you could be closed, you could shift. Some people complain, quite frankly, that Apple is so strict. There was a lawsuit a couple of years ago from a company that had based its entire multi-million dollar marketing budget on its app for iOS. I've had an app approved from Apple. It can take a while. What happens if it's time sensitive? It's not like you can call and talk to the person in charge of approving it. So there are benefits to being a more closed ecosystem, but then there are benefits of being open. This is an amazing statistic. Around 2001, 2002, guess what percentage of devices connected to the internet via Microsoft Windows? 
Anyone? Yeah. It's, it's the upper 90s. And guess what that number is today? About a year ago, I heard a statistic that something like only 24% of all devices connected to the internet use some form of Windows. I bet you it's under 20 these days. I believe um, Android owns about 70%. The interesting thing, though, is that even though Android has a dominant market share, most of the money goes to Apple developers. Apple has paid developers over $13 billion. Uh, one of the key points of the book is this notion of frenemies. So Google sets out to hurt Apple in iOS. So they buy Android. It was an Israeli company in 2007. They make it freely available. And most people connecting to the web these days, most people using smartphones, use some version of Android. It's probably forked, right, because the version that maybe Google sanctions isn't the one that Amazon or Nook uses. But in the process of harming Apple, Google empowered Samsung. So that's one of the, I think, more interesting notions in the book. As I said, it's essential to add new and popular planks. I mentioned with Google+, Plus, they realize that social networks are important. A couple of months ago, Larry Page was on the Charlie Rose Show, and he was lamenting the fact that the Facebook data isn't open. Right? And I understand exactly where he was coming from. But think about it. If you're Mark Zuckerberg and your company doesn't sell anything, it's all about the data, why would you let someone like Google index it? Right? I, can't, I can Google. Big pet peeve of mine on websites don't have a search bar. I know how to do Google site search. It's just annoying to have to do it. But you can't Google Facebook, if that makes any sense. The Gang of Four also cross-pollinates. Google has an official Twitter feed. Amazon has an official YouTube channel. Right? Doesn't mean that Apple is going to launch a social network and overtake Facebook. That's just not going to happen. In fact, I remember in previous versions of iTunes, they introduced the ability to ping. So in theory, right, you could like the same songs. Oh, yeah, you like the same song. Yeah, we can go to a Rush concert together. Apple has taken that away because they figured, you know what, we're really not going to do social network. Well, why should we even try? But as a general rule, you will see these companies experiment with different things. Amazon, for instance, is getting into original programming, which, as Reed Hastings will tell you from Netflix, isn't very cheap. Okay. Alternatively stated, they use other platforms as planks in their own. Right? And I do the same thing as a small business person. Um, it would be silly for me not to have my book sold on Amazon, even if Amazon takes a 30% cut. Ditto with my app in the um, App Store. Now, let's talk a little bit about ecosystems and how they've evolved over the last decade or so. Because, as I said before, technology platforms have existed for a long time, but there are some differences today and a decade ago. So what's different now compared to, say, the late 1990s? Well, back then, as someone who came from an enterprise IT background, I find that the technology were similar, but they're more powerful today. Systems tended to be a lot more closed. There was no such thing as an enterprise app store, which is exactly what Mark Benioff is building with Salesforce and Force.com. Okay. And the partnerships were a lot more limited. I remember working with enterprise IT vendors. It was a big deal to have on your business card that you were a partner of Oracle or a partner of PeopleSoft or IBM. Today, in the book, I argue that these ecosystems have become much more expansive. They're much more open. Right? And even in the last two years since the book's been out, I've been amazed at how much is out there. I was reading some of the Vista literature before about Git and GitHub. I mean, it's amazing to me how many startups are spending very little money to get going these days with AWS, with WordPress, with other open source software, with open APIs and SDKs. I mentioned this last night. Salon.com back in 2000, 1999-ish, needed something like $100 million to start. Now, if you want to start a company, we're talking about orders of magnitude less money. But that's not the only change. There's also been a major shift with regard to what I'll call target markets. They used to be predominantly business oriented. Um, we're talking about using the best technology at work, right? not at home. Um, I've worked at some organizations in which my smartphone was more powerful than the desktops that people had not to mention my access to technology. We live in a fundamentally different time now. Yes, 
the enterprise IT market matters. In fact, if you take a look at the last uh, year or so, some of the companies that have gone public, like Jive, like Splunk, like Tableau Software, have been very squarely towards the enterprise. Right? It, arguably, now we'll see what happens with Twitter, because it, in theory, could go public any month now. But Facebook may have poisoned the well, again, even though the Facebook stock has gone up. It's a combination of business and consumer IT. The ecosystems of Ford tended to be relatively stable. A lot of enterprise IT vendors maintain the same relationships with their partners for years. Um, and has anyone ever heard the term VAR, value-added reseller? Okay. Now, partnerships are incredibly dynamic. Uh, they're vibrant. They are, might be with individual developers. They might be with small partners. Things are changing very quickly and not always for the better. Every time, say, Facebook makes a change to its platform, invariably developers are upset, okay? Or Twitter. Um, Amazon incurred the wrath of publishers for years by constantly writing them. So there's a great Arabic proverb, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Very true these days. Like I mentioned before with Samsung and Google and Apple. So it's very interesting to me that there aren't necessarily these long-term alliances anymore. Has anyone ever played the board game Risk? It's a lot like Risk, I think, because you say that you've got somebody who's winning. Hey, we should beat up on this guy. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. And then you realize that you can knock him out of South America and take his cards, and all of a sudden you're going, well, I don't really need you anymore. So it's a lot like Risk. But also collaboration is very different. Um, it, it used to be, I find, very one-sided. Right? We'll buy you or we'll crush you. Now, while that certainly exists to some extent, I find that the collaboration is a little bit different as well. Companies really want to grow the pie with you. They want to work together. It's more cooperation based. Now, just as an example, there's a 70-30 split that we typically see. With publishers, they typically can get 70% take on an ebook. Or if you sell an app in the App Store, Apple takes 30%. You keep the other 70%. Right? So there's something in it for them, but most of it's there for you. And the technology, I would argue, is very, very different. Back then, most of it, I believe, was closed source or proprietary. Companies protected their secrets. It was very difficult to get to the source code. I remember in my days doing uh, Lawson and PeopleSoft consulting, just getting access to a data dictionary or an ERD, Entity Relationship Diagram, was often very difficult. Companies kept these things very close to their vests. These days, so much is open, right? Preaching to the choir here. Much more open source software. Yes, there still is proprietary software. But when we see software development kits and APIs, companies are in effect saying, we want you to build on top of this. Okay. So the technology is very different and the mindset along with that. And as a result, I believe innovation has changed too. It typically tended to be from the top down. Uh, companies would often buy other companies that complemented their products or services. And it was typically very slow. These days, a lot of the innovation is bottom up. Just take a look, as I said before, at a site like Kickstarter. There are some crazy projects that get funded. Has anyone ever heard of the Pebble Watch? This is an amazing story. Uh, the guys who started the company wanted to raise $100,000. And I guarantee you at one point they went to VC firms or angels or their parents and said, we, we need 100 grand to build a watch. People said, watches? Watches are dead. No one wears a watch anymore. Right? This was before Samsung and Apple were getting into watches. Does anyone know how much they raised on Kickstarter? They wanted 100,000. Think higher. Not even close. <coughs> 10 million. I heard 10 million. And they stopped at that. They actually sold so many pre-orders for this sort of watch as a platform, if you like. People would build it, open APIs, apps on top of watches, that they had to stop. People were angry because this has got picked up by Best Buy. Not everyone has even received their watch yet, and they started that project two years ago. That's an example of this sort of bottom-up innovation. Or there was a um, movie called Victoria Mars, and it came out three or four years ago. They just raised $4 million on Kickstarter to do a sequel. Zach Braff, also an actor based out of New Jersey, who did the movie Garden State, wants to do a sort of sequel. And instead of going to the movie studios and them having all the creative control, 
he's reached out to the community and he raised, I believe, I was one of the backers, something like $3 million in a couple of weeks. So a lot of the innovation is coming bottom, from the bottom up. One of the key points in the book is this notion that ecosystems promote external innovation. Who knows where the innovations are going to come from? Uh, last night I mentioned that Angry Birds has been downloaded, I don't know, it's probably up to 400 million times by now. Now Steve Jobs, most people would agree, was a pretty smart guy. I find it extremely difficult to believe though that he knew that after the App Store was launched, which remember did not ship initially with iTunes, that Angry Birds would be downloaded so many times. But in a way, you're outsourcing your innovation, right? You're saying, we'll take 30% of it, unless you want to give it away for free. Right? That significantly drops the costs of innovation. We're not just talking about innovation from a company's R&D department. We're talking about it on a much more massive scale. Right? And in some cases, it isn't necessarily even the quality of the hardware or the software per se. A lot of times people will say, well, it looks like a de decent device, but what about the apps? I just read yesterday that Instagram was finally available for the Windows Phone. Think about it. Now, I'm not saying Instagram is the world's greatest app, but why did Facebook pay a billion dollars for it in cash and stock? Was it about a year and a half ago? Because that had 30 million users. So sometimes it isn't necessarily just the device, it's the apps that go along with it. Same thing with BlackBerry, where now it's called, uh, I'm sorry, it was called RIM, now it's called BlackBerry. That, you want to talk about a fall from grace. Does anyone here own a BlackBerry? One, two, okay, three, four. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who do own it, I would be shocked if your next phone is a BlackBerry. And some people like the keyboards. I have an iPhone myself. I miss the actual keys for typing. But I know that the apps for iOS are just far better. And to me, it's worth the, the trade-off. Now, anyone could say we want to promote external innovation, but you have to give developers the tools. Right? I'm talking here about SDKs. You can't expect people to necessarily build the tools themselves. You want to make it easy for them to build these types of things. And it's amazing. I saw a TED video of a 12-year-old that was on his third app, 12 years old. Um, so it's about software development kits, but it's also about APIs and giving people access to your data. Yes, ETL will still exist for a long time, particularly in the enterprise. But we want that data immediately. If you're building an app on top of Twitter, do you really want to go through some ETL batch job to import it, and then your data isn't real time? APIs encourage that. And like I said, SDKs are incredible. Um, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to make at least some of them open to developers. So the tools are very important. I'm going to talk a little bit about incentives. I can give you all the tools I want, but there have to be the incentives. BlackBerry had worked out this program before it declared bankruptcy in which developers were guaranteed a certain take even if their apps didn't sell. Now, it didn't go anywhere, but to their credit, BlackBerry understood the importance of giving developers some skin in the game. Some apps are more complicated than others. My own app is very basic. It took the firm two days or something to build it. But if you want a developer to spend months and months developing an app, there has to be some sort of reward. Even if the tools are there, the incentives need to be. Microsoft, I believe, at one point was offering developers $10,000 for apps minimum, sort of a floor. You know at least you'd get that much. So incentives and tools are absolutely essential. But again, they guarantee nothing. As a general rule, though, if you have a lot of activity, you see some pretty cool things happening. And I want to talk a little bit about two specific examples of these ecosystems in action. Does anyone know who this is? This is a man by the name of Jordan Rudess. He is the keyboardist in one of my favorite bands, Dream Theater. At the age of nine, he went to the Juilliard School of Music. Nine. The word prodigy applies to this guy. Now he's a classically trained pianist, but he plays in this progressive rock band called Dream Theater. But he has this inherent interest in technology. He was one of the first guys to adopt the Moog synthesizers in the 70s. When he's not playing piano and being in Dream Theater, he started an app development company called Wisdom Music. 
So when he's on stage playing before his iPhone, now his iPad, you have these crazy sounds going off in front of five, ten thousand 10,000 people. And a lot of Dream Theater fans are musicians. So they're going, huh, that looks really cool. I'm going to buy it. So again, Apple is outsourcing, in a way, the innovation here. Rudess is basically marketing for Apple and for himself while he's playing in Dream Theater. Now, anyone know who this is? This is a woman by the name of Amanda Hawking. And she's a probably by now 26-year-old writer of teen vampire stuff, think Twilight. Not my particular brand of vodka. She was making about $250,000 a year on Amazon selling these Kindle singles. Right? She had developed what Seth Godin would call a tribe. And they didn't care that she wasn't working with a proper publisher. She had made, in a four-year period, over a million dollars selling eBooks, which for a 25-year-old in this economy, writing for a living, I wish I made that much. So she had cultivated such a following that instead of chasing down proper publishers, they chased her down. And she ultimately signed a $2 million four-book deal with St. Martin's Press. So these are just examples of people who are putting their products or their apps or their books out there and are reaping the benefits. Now, I've talked a lot today about platforms and how they are beneficial. But one of my favorite technology quotes comes from Melvin Kranzberg. He has six laws of technology, my favorite of which is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. In other words, there's always a downside. And the same is true with platforms. I mentioned this last night, but has anyone heard of a company called StockTwits? StockTwits was founded about three years ago by the name of Howard Lindzen. And he used the Twitter API, brought in the data, and created a cash tag. Not a hashtag, right? We all know what that is, but a cash tag. So for, for instance, if you clicked on dollar sign AAPL, you would get Apple's market cap. It's PDE, it's current stock price. Pretty cool. He developed the following. And Twitter came along and said, that's a really good idea. We're going to do that. And Lindzen wrote a scathing blog post. He was absolutely irate because in his view, Twitter stole his invention. I can't disagree with him, but I would also add that if it weren't for Twitter and the open API, your company doesn't exist. You don't have access to that information. A user base of 10 or 100 or 1,000 people is nothing compared to the 215 million people who currently use Twitter. So as I said before, Twitter has closed its platform a bit. It's something that you have to think about in this age of the platform. Like I said before, this notion of frenemies, this notion of competition. What happens when your partners start competing with you? Every Amazon partner asks itself that question. But I don't want to just pick on Twitter here. Facebook has borrowed certain things as well. Recently, Twitter, excuse me, Facebook announced that it was supporting hashtags. Anyone, a lot of you use Facebook, right? I know you sat down before. OK, you can use searchable hashtags on Facebook now. Also, a couple years ago, Twitter had announced verified accounts, that little blue check mark, so you know that it's the real Marshall Lynch or the real Barack Obama. Facebook does the same thing. So we see a lot of borrowing going on here. And I can see there being some legitimate issues with regard to patents, but that's an entirely different discussion. The interesting thing, though, about, say, hashtags is that the initial version of Twitter didn't ship with hashtags. It didn't ship with the retweet button. All of those inventions came from the community, the users. A guy by the name of Chris Messina invented the hashtag. He said, wouldn't it be useful if there were a way to search across Twitter accounts through a common term? And to their credit, the guys at Twitter said, that's a really good idea. Same thing with the retweet button, which now we just think is standard. Again, when you make your platform open and you listen to your community, good things can... Now, you're going to get a lot of bad ideas, too. Right? I doubt that every idea that came to the guys at Twitter or Facebook was a good one. But isn't it better to have people come to you with ideas than deploy a team of people who are sitting in a vacuum and say, oh, we think it should go this way, but you really don't know. If you look at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, all of them, to different degrees, do something called A-B testing or split testing. So you might see 
and Marissa Meyer was famous for this when she was with Google. She drove people crazy. She wanted the data on everything. They are constantly testing. If you see a different feature in Facebook than I do, it's very common. There's this notion that there's one Amazon homepage. No, there's not. My Amazon homepage, I guarantee, is different than yours because without knowing anything about you, I doubt that we buy the same things. These companies use technologies just like Netflix called collaborative filtering. They're looking at the data and they're presenting a different user experience. So what happens when these companies borrow ideas? I don't have the answer to that question, but it's just something that you have to think about. Right? We're not talking about being very proprietary or very turfy. We're talking about doing things in a very public forum. And I'm fairly certain, I'm not an attorney, that, but you can't patent something like a hashtag. User experience is absolutely essential. Um, when I think about the early days of the internet and how clunky it was, it just got to be ridiculous. Now, with say, uh, Open Auth or Facebook Connect or logging in with Twitter, these sites are making it incredibly easy for you not to go through some arduous sign-up process. Right? They're worried that if it's too difficult, people won't go there. When you buy a Kindle and you type in your email address and you sign in, it knows your history. Right? The UI is amazing. Amazon keeps pushing the envelope with this. You can now listen to an audio book and stop it on your iPhone or your Kindle and then go back to, say, your iPad and it knows where you are. It's all in sync. They're constantly worried about the user because coming full circle here, you're not using these products because you have to. You're using them because you want to. Big difference. Imagine if you had to log into Google Plus with a different set of credentials than YouTube or Gmail. Right? I'm not that patient. <laughs> the goal here is to, if not eliminate friction, then absolutely to reduce it. And I think that for the most part, these companies have done a good job of that. Single sign-on is a big part of that. I mentioned before Facebook Connect. You want to make it easy for people to do this, but not too easy. As a test, when I was writing The Age of the Platform, I said to myself, what if I wanted to register as Barack Obama? Now, what do we have in this country, 310 million people? I'll bet you a Coke that there's actually somebody named Barack Obama. But Facebook made me go through an additional step to verify that I was who I said I was. And I didn't just do it with the president. I did it with Bruce Willis, just for giggles. So you don't want to make it friction free. Remember, the early days of the web were about privacy more than today. Today, it's, it's all about being authentic. You want people to know, yeah, I said this. Of course, you can still be a troll. Of course, you can still post anonymous economists. That's never going to go away. But Facebook wants to take steps to ensure that you are who you say you are. Now, 1.2 billion users, do I think those are all accurate? Of course not, right? What constitutes a user? I have set up, for some reason, there's a glitch in the matrix. I can't add my aunt as a friend on Facebook. I don't know why. I like my aunt. She likes me. So I set up a dummy account. Let me see if I can add her then. And all of a sudden, I could. So I don't always think that those statistics are right. And what constitutes a user? Right? Google Plus, 400 million users. OK, does that mean that you have Gmail? I mean, just a show of hands here. Does anyone actively use Google Plus? OK. So if this is a representative sample, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I question those numbers. But again, the user experience, I think, is very important. So a few questions, and then I'll open it up. When you think about Vista, how can Vista embrace platform thinking? Right? How can it build its ecosystem, developers, users, partners? Are there any particular planks that Vista can develop or improve upon? What's missing? Um, my friend, Scott Birkin, who went to school with me and has also written five books, just wrote a book about his time at WordPress. It's called the year without pants. And WordPress or Automatic runs roughly one out of five sites on the web. And it's a really interesting book. I highly recommend it, not just because he's a friend of mine, but also because he talks about being inside WordPress and how a lot of the changes, a lot of the innovations tended to be incremental as opposed to far reaching, just the way the company was distributed. So that's, I think, a problem with certain organizations. How can you attract third-party developers? Do you have the tools? Do you have the incentives? Or are you just relying upon the community to volunteer? 
How could Vista grow its ecosystem? Okay. What are the downsides? So these are just a few things to think about as we take some questions. But if you want to connect with me, here's all the good stuff. I finally got philsimon.com. Quick piece of tech advice. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Act Now Domains, amazing site. For years, I tried to get philsimon.com. I actually reached out to the guy through whois.com, some guy in Pennsylvania named Phil Simon. And he's not doing anything with the site. He parked it. I called him. I, I decided to send him an email. Nothing. Act Now Domains. Bam, $70. I would have paid a lot more than that. But I digress. So any questions you have about platforms, ecosystems, disagreements? Yes. So the example that you gave, uh, the OK. Good question. I'll just repeat it in case those in the back in here. The question was, if you're Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google, the world is your oyster. Billions and billions of people forget you know, China's closed. Facebook can't get in there. What do you do if you're trying to penetrate a smaller market? And while healthcare may be a smaller market, I don't think it would be considered small. What are we talking about in the US? $3 trillion a year, which is what, 16% of our GDP? One thing to think about, I didn't mention this before, but why did Microsoft spend a billion dollars when it already owned SharePoint on a collaborative tool whose name escapes me. Sorry? Not Skype. It's, uh, the, the name escapes me right now. But about two years ago, they spent uh, more than a billion dollars for basically collaborative software, um, which some people kind of questioned. Because is it, if anyone wants to Google it, let me know. Microsoft billion dollar acquisition, uh, not Jive. It's, sorry? N no, not Microsoft Link. It, it, it doesn't matter. But they spent over a billion dollars on this collaborative software because the software was based on the freemium model. Now, if anyone's ever had to configure SharePoint, you realize that it's a very top-down process. But this social software that Microsoft bought, again, the name escapes me, was very organic. It was very bottom-up. Microsoft bought it because millions of people were paying a very little, but most people were paying for the, were basically using the free version. Microsoft was able to acquire that user base. That software was not implemented because the CIO said, oh, we all, we all should use this. It was implemented because it was useful and it was free. So it grew from the bottom up. So my question to you is, is that type of thing possible with Vista? Is it possible to sort of get, become a Trojan horse and get in there, get some key people using it, and all of a sudden, People go, wow, this is really useful. If we only can do this, well, you have to pay for it. I'm just asking. Yammer, thank you. Yes, Yammer. That was going to bother me all day. But yeah, Microsoft paid more than a billion dollars for Yammer when some people said, why are you buying Yammer? You have SharePoint. Well, trust me, I'm no expert at SharePoint, but it's not like you can just download it and set it up and start using it. Yeah. The question for those who didn't hear, how do, you get, how do you basically penetrate this? And I'm not going to say that it's easy. Because when you think about Yammer right, and being able to share a corporate document, well, most organizations don't have to deal with HIPAA. right? Most so I don't necessarily have an easy answer to the problem. But there have to be some tech savvy people out there. Uh, a guy I mentioned in the previous book on big data, uh, his Twitter handle is KevinMD. And he's one of the very vocal proponents of bringing technology into healthcare. So if you can't penetrate an enterprise, is it possible to reach out to independent bloggers and thought leaders? Basically, I think most people would agree that healthcare is broken, right? Three trillion dollars, growing at what, a rate of six, seven percent a year? A complete mess when you think about entitlements. I'm not saying that it's necessarily the solution, but there are other people out there who realize that the status quo is not tenable. Uh, my general view of the world, and this goes all the way back to the first book, 
is that there are three types of people in this world. And I think I even mentioned it last night to a few people. There are those people who get it, hopefully people in this room. There are those people who don't get it but want to get it. I can deal with those people, right? They want to learn. My landscaper, I joke, um, had a website that was built in 1997. And when you think about a landscaper's website, it should be pretty visual, right? Interactive, responsive. Oh, that looks cool. Oh, how did you do that with the waterfall? Knock a couple grand off my trees and my grass and the plants, and I'll build your website. So he said, no problem. He says, now his website looks great. He comes to me and he says, hey, Phil, how do I embed a YouTube video again? I love that because he wants to learn. The third group, and the group I'd have you avoid, is the, those that don't get it and don't want to get it. Um, if you read The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about connectors, right, and how hush puppies become popular in Manhattan and reaching out to individual people. If you could find the thought leaders and even just one organization that gets it, and then it's a case study and people are asking about it, I think you'll drive yourself less crazy than if you try to go after the big fish that doesn't get it because you know what, their profits have been incredibly healthy and what you're proposing from their perspective doesn't make any sense because ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think getting users, getting people involved, someone goes, oh, this is really good, but what if it did this? And all of a sudden, there could be some groundswell of support for it. Um, I agree, though, with my background in healthcare, I know that there are many facets to it, right? Uh, I key keynoted six weeks ago in Manhattan at a company, and it's a big data company that brings in different claims data, different clinical data, and they're working on other types of data. And I think you've got open data out there, you've got linked data out there. What if you brought it all together? What if you started to see patterns that you couldn't see before? You don't necessarily have to go after the entire hospital. You maybe just find uh, a part within the hospital or a department or even a progressive doctor conceivably. So it, it's not necessarily all or nothing, right? And you may find that certain types of hospitals, certain geographies, certain areas of the country are more responsive, and they're more open to it. But trying to convince, I just, as a consultant, I don't want to spend my time arguing with, I'd, I'd spent way too much, I joke with people, if I didn't write this book, I would have needed to see a shrink. Other questions? Yes. Got it. You'll never get me to say too many bad things about APIs. Because um, who knows where it can go? And I think that makes a lot of potentially hospitals and bureaucrats and, you know, I, th I think about the nature of change. And I don't agree with it, but when I think about a 55-year-old CIO who sees a retirement on the horizon and why they're resisting things like big data, do I agree with it? No. Do I understand it? Of course. So if you can find people who are upset with the status quo, people who are willing to take those chances for whatever reason, I think that's probably a good thing. Because it would be presumptuous of me to say, oh, you, you can't do this with an API. I mean, people still told Steve Jobs with his reality dis distortion field, the iPod will never work. People told that with, when Bezos, as I'm reading now, wanted to create the Kindle, he said, oh, it has to come with Wi-Fi. People said, are you crazy? This is 2006. So I, I can't tell you that something can't be done. Um, I think the options with APIs are exponentially higher than without. Uh, is there a question behind? How do you deal with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am no expert on Epic, but I understand it's the market leader. The question was, what do you do about Epic? Well, remember what I mentioned before about Microsoft in the early uh, 2000s, owning 95% of the market share? So they might have the lead, but you can't tell me that they can't possibly fall from grace. Now, will it happen overnight in healthcare? Probably not. But what if it starts with the one user, the one hospital, the one doctor? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, yes. Can you, for, for those who didn't hear, can you circumvent the uh, blockages, right, or the, uh, the obstacles? Um, there are so many different things going on with healthcare right now. I actually switched insurance companies in large part. Quick story, and, and I'll, I'll get to your question. Um, I absolutely despise inefficiency. It's just in my DNA. And I was getting annoyed that with my previous insurance company, I would have to call, go to the website, find a doctor, call 10 doctors and go, well, do you have anything for a week? Ridiculous. Right? So there's a site. Has anyone ever heard of ZocDoc? Okay. ZocDoc lets participating doctor's offices put their schedules online. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. So I saw that Aetna participated in it. And I said to myself, I'm going to switch just on the basis of that. So I can go online and say, I'd love to see a doctor on Tuesday. I don't want to drive 60 miles, but I'll drive within 10 to 15 miles. So. That's just an example, I think, of going directly to, because now the doctors have to participate. You can't force them. And they have all sorts of different systems for scheduling and blah, blah, blah. But eventually, there are only so many, right? And you work with, if you're a system integrator, you work with enough of them, and you see the benefits of it, right? I selected a doctor because that doctor now was on ZocDoc, and it was easier for me. So I agree. Because of the user experience, because people like me realize that there have to be a better way, I'm not saying it happens overnight. There are plenty of people who are a lot more powerful than I am, who don't think anything's broken. And as I was saying before, trying to convince those people that they're wrong is probably not going to go anywhere. But what if there is this ground? So what if enough people like me said, I'm leaving insurance company X to go to this other one because their website's better, their services are better, their apps are better? Yeah. I think that a lot of change does come from the bottom up. I also think that we're dealing with an increasingly tech and data savvy workforce. The book I'm working on now is on data visualization. It's called the visual organization. But it really, when you think about it, isn't just this abstract concept of a visual organization. It's about visual employees and visual citizens. We're constantly walking around consuming and generating data. I was recently in Seoul, South Korea. And <laughs> I got the biggest laugh from the audience when I said, and it was, being, it was being translated, so something was probably lost in translation. He said, here's the major similarity between Seoul and America, any city. And it's exactly like that there. So more people, I think, are becoming fundamentally impatient. We live in this era of self-service. I go back 15 years to when I wasn't as technical as I am today, and I'd have to ask IT to write a report for me. And everyone here has been through that, right? You ask for this, they give you that. Back and forth, back and forth, eventually you just say, forget it. Eventually, I got pretty good at writing reports. So I used to, as, one, as a consultant, I, I think I did a pretty good job of understanding what the technical people wanted, but what the functional people wanted. And being able to speak both languages was huge. But I agree. I think a lot of it will come from people who go, this is ridiculous. And maybe it starts with someone like me going, I can't believe I'm sitting here with my iPhone in the doctor's office with more technology than what was used to put the first man into space. And I'm filling out forms. <laughs> <laughs> Why hasn't that changed in my lifetime? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully enough people will go, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore, and do something about it. So if Vista can find uh, a home in more progressive organizations with much more progressive think Again, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not trying to miss legal concerns, but trying to convince a whole bunch of people who are very successful doing what they're doing that they need to change is typically an exercise in futility. Yeah.
Okay. I'll let you wrap up the question. Other questions? I, I have very little to add to what you said. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For those who didn't hear, quantified cell, Fitbit, wearable technology, we're, we're just getting started here. Whether or not you're uh, a Google Glass fan or not, I actually had the chance to check that out. One of my friends is a developer, and I wrote an amusing post on my site about how, since I live in Vegas, Google Glass knows me from my Google history, and it started marching me involuntarily towards a casino. And I, uh, I'd said Bing, and the thing crashed. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, absolutely. That's where things are going. I, I honestly believe that we are getting near a tipping point, and without getting political, it doesn't matter if you're left or right. I don't think that the status quo is sustainable. I saw a statistic the other day that something like 50% uh, of all Americans thought they needed to work until they, they died. Um, I think there's tremendous opportunity. If you can get on board with something like that, if you can maybe figure out, I mean, why were developers paying $1,500 for an early version of Google Glass, right? Why are companies like Evernote developing apps for Google Glass, right? To their credit, the guys at Google say, look, it's not enough if this is just cool. We're, we know that we're not going to have all the good ideas. Right? For every, though I showed you the two examples of ecosystems there at work, I could have showed you, you know, my app hasn't been downloaded <laughs> anywhere near 300 million times. But once you, I think, understand that that's where things are going, and as I said before, people like me hopefully are not completely exceptional, and they sit there and they go, there has to be a better way. We are generating ridiculous amounts of data. This was going to be my giveaway uh, before. But they actually now have to invent new terms to describe. Everyone knows about gigabytes and terabytes, maybe petabytes. It gets into exabytes and yottabytes. The, the body responsible for this, you want to talk about geeks in a room. They actually create terms 
And the, does anyone know the newest term? It's something like one with a 27 zeros at the end of it, bytes. After zettabytes. They just came out with it. Broncobytes. Bronco. Right. So we are generating more and more data. It's actually, at, I mentioned this last night when I talked to a few people, but after the age of the platform came out, I was giving a talk not uh, dissimilar to this one in which they said, well, can you talk about data? I said, sure, these companies generate a lot of data. And then before I knew it, I was working on the new book on big data. So do I think there's potential opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, got, Lord only knows where things are going, but you can't tell me with a quantified self from what I've read about it that that's a fad. I mean, we are just becoming more comfortable with data. We get annoyed, right? I, I know of a guy who broke with his publisher because he wanted basic sales data. They wouldn't give it to him. So more and more of us, I think, are demanding data. I think that's an enormous potential opportunity. Um, as I said, I'm researching the new book and just the way that you can visualize it and see different things. Um, getting on board with data, we talked last night about the semantic web. All those things, I think, increase the chances. But I'll close with this. I don't really believe in checklists. Companies can build platforms and nothing necessarily will happen. Right? Build a platform for beepers. I don't think beepers are coming back anytime soon. So just understand that there's this inherent unpredictability and that we have to be comfortable with not being comfortable, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, um, but uh, I think we're done. So anyway, thank you all for your time and attention. I'll be signing books today. Later.